Welcome to GovCast. I'm your host, Amy Kluber. GovCIO Media and Research is live here at the 2022 HIMSS Conference in Orlando. Throughout this week, we'll be releasing special episodes catching up with the federal leaders at the show across our podcast platforms, including HealthCast and CyberCast. Sitting with me now is former CIO of the Department of Veterans Affairs, James Jaffer, who helmed his position for two years. So, Jim, great to connect with you in person here at Hims. Great to see you, Amy, back out for your first event, right? Yes, this is my first one. It's been weird, <laughs> but uh, I think everyone's getting back to normal, which is pretty good to hear. Or as someone, one of my uh, uh, industry partners said, normal-ish. <laughs> normal-ish, exactly. Yeah. So how's the conference been for you? Uh, tremendous. Uh, lots of folks here, uh, you know, very vigorous industry partner engagement. Uh, you know, I want to give a shout out to the, the VA executive, the chief acquisition officer, Mike Parrish, who's been out just deliberately, diligently burning up the shoe leather and walking around and meeting with industry partners. So some, some excellent panels, the type of industry engagement we need for VA and for other federal health entities. Uh, it's, it's really tremendous. Wouldn't miss it for the world. Fantastic. Well, I'm glad to be a part of that now, I guess. Uh, so a little, it's been a little over a year since you were actually on the show on GovCast, but it looked very different then. You had a, a different role. Things have changed since that time. Uh, so how has it been since then? Sure. I mean, uh, for, you know, for, for me personally and professionally, it's it's been a, a great chance to continue to serve the VA and the federal health ecosystem just in a different capacity. Uh, you know, so that, that you know, kind of mantra and attitude of service hasn't changed. It's just, again, serving differently. It's interesting to see kind of, you know, where uh, the VA is going. They have their, their permanent leadership with OIT now with Kurt Del Benny and, and Dr. Evans remains. So, you know, very, very uh, bright and positive future for them. I think the question always becomes, you know, will they get the funding they need? Again, you know, it's a, it's a department that continues to grow endlessly around programs, around facilities, around clinicians, um, and somehow OIT doesn't get the funding it needs to keep, up to, to keep up to growth and to keep up to demand. So I think that's the big challenge for the VA. Ever-present problem that I'm sure you're right. way too familiar with. Right. <laughs> Reflecting on your time in that position, were there any moments that stood out to you? Sure. I was, you know, recalling to a former colleague recently that, you know, there was only one moment, and we may have talked about this even in, the, in past podcasts, that there really was one of concern. And it was a moment where, you know, there are a lot of federal agencies during the pandemic that were uh, well positioned for remote work. VA was not one of them by largely by design and by delivery methods. And so that was in March and April of that year is how are we going to take what we thought could be up to 75% increase, uh, well, up to 75% of the workforce that would go remote. And, uh, you know, just getting from the current state to that rapid future state uh, with the lack of investment that had been done in VA, especially around the tick gateways and around endpoints and all the things that, you know, people take for granted with uh, in IT, certainly in health IT. You know, I, I always joke that it's like oxygen. You truly don't appreciate it until it's gone um, and, and or you don't have enough of it. Um, and so, uh, you know, the OIT team uh, did great working with our, our VHA, VBA and other partners. But, yeah, there were some there were some tense moments where we we didn't know how bright or dim the future was going to look in as the as the pandemic rolled out. But we were, I guess we were all in this together, and VA kind of led that way. Um, you oversaw a lot of the programs that were stood up during the pandemic. Sure. I mean, uh, you, you, you look back on that time frame, and there's some, some landmark programs, certainly not the least of which was Mission Act and Community Care. Again, highly relevant here to the, the payer and provider ecosystem partners that are here at HIMSS. Also, the Caregivers Program. Um, you know, the, the ability to finally get the right uh, solution, the system uh, to support, uh, you know, the rollout of, of caregivers and that, and that really critical benefit within VA. Uh, certainly the rise of telehealth um, and, you know, uh, assisting uh, VHA and their team, Dr. Galpin, uh, you know, Eddie Poole and our solutions delivery and our folks uh, were able to take them and the industry uh, providers that were servicing that telehealth platform via Video Connect and take them from 2,500 appointments a day to over 40,000 a day, right? But that, you know, it, it sounds easy, uh, but, you know, when you look at scaling a system that was largely on-premise and 
all the uh, you know gymnastics that were involved in getting it to the cloud and scaling it up so that it could you know deliver that sort of capacity again. Those things are like oxygen; they're taken for granted. I think too that just a little future casting here is people still talk about telehealth. I mean, telehealth is good; it's essential. Uh, it's a '90s technology, and and really, you look at the innovative healthcare systems that are here at Hims, the Mayo's, the Kaiser Permanentes, and others, and they're moving to a care from the home model, and that's going to require more than telehealth, right? It's going to require, you know, a suite of, you know, decre- uh, decreasing cost items, you know, pulse oximeters, blood pressure devices, all, all the things. It's going to require what Dr. Halamka uh, from Mayo refers to as the Uberization of care, right? So, but this is, this is something the VA and others are going to have to navigate because especially as the demographic shift occurs with veterans in the country and, f- and more and more are rural or have less access, uh, the increasing costs of community care, but even just the notion that veterans like myself are going to want that care, if at all possible, delivered in the home, right, for all the reasons that clinicians and patients know and want. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I think it's more than than just being able to connect, you know, as we're kind of learning here at Hims too, there's the infrastructure and then the other uh, beast, you know, security and that we're, we're seeing uh, being challenged <laughs> over the past couple of years. So um, are there any grievances that you would want to mention from your time at VA or things you would have done differently? Is this like a Seinfeld episode? It's an airing of the grievances? No. Yeah, no. It's... um I mean, certainly there's always things that, uh, again, could have could have been done uh, better. But, uh, you know, you uh, the, the old quote that, you know, you go to the you go to war with the army you have, not the one you wish you have. And I think, you know, what that what that highlights for the VA and for other organizations, too, is the need to get to that levelized investment. Again, maintaining growth, uh, maintain, you know, maintaining technology, truly digitally transforming in, in the years when you're not in the middle of a pandemic so that when the next crisis crisis comes, it finds you ready. So, you know, the, the VA is, is, is again, lags uh, significantly. It's like 14 of 14 large federal agencies for IT spend. I always tell people, you know, $4.9 billion seems like a lot. That's your numerator. But when your denominator is going up at a faster rate and it's like 120 to $130 billion, it, that, that number gets really small. I mean, this year they're only at about 3.9%. Uh, spend of discretionary budget and, and it's going down, right? So again, and so if you're, if you're not able to, uh, spend over 5%, 5% alone is enough to get you your operations and maintenance. You're not innovating. You're not expanding. Again, you're not matching growth and demand within an agency that continues to grow. Wow. And it's such a big agency, too. So I, I don't think people really understand how big it really is. You know, in our, in our, in our recent webcast, we talked about one out of every 4.3 federal civilian employees works at the VA. Four, 425,000 out of 1.845 million, as I recall, the, the denominator. Yeah. And you can say that again and again and again. And I'll still be surprised every time you say it. That's right. That's a, That's exactly right. <laughs> So how would you describe some of the programs that you kind of helped stand up and lead during the time, seeing them now play out? Do you still feel some kind of attachment to them? Um, you, you know, of course. I mean, I certainly follow them a little bit closer maybe than the average bear, right? Uh, but, you know, I, I am looking more at kind of, what you know, what's the next chapter, right? You know, what, what are the next programs? Again, there's... Uh, you know, there's a, there's there's you know no end to the next thing that's going to be legislated or mandated or, or thrust upon VA or VA will you know self discover what it needs to provide. Uh, you know, and, that, and that's not just in VHA. You know, we're at a health IT conference, but I I do also remind people that uh, you know as important as VHA is, there's that small little hundred fifty billion dollar financial services entity within VA called Veterans Benefits Administration. Uh, certainly National Cemetery and their critical memorial services. So there's there's lots of other things that uh, leadership and the CIO at VA have to be attentive to in terms of those line of business needs. You know, the one the one thing I, I, I have been kind of uh, uh, a little bit uh, emphasizing is this whole outdated notion, too, that with all these major, major modernization programs that these are, quote, uh, IT systems, unquote, they are not. They are business transformation systems, and it highlights, you know, what the so what on that is it highlights that um, if you're a line of business partner, if you're a, a business unit head like you are in commercial, but certainly in the government, 
you have to understand technology and you have to be a partner at the table. You have to, you have to, uh, you know, answer the requirements in a, in a very agile methodology. Uh, you have to partner with technologists and with security professionals to, to deliver that digital transformation. It, it's not the old days of throw it over the wall, you know, let IT work on it for 12 months. There are, you know, there are no big bang programs anymore. Um, and, and really, the line of business partners need to be front and center on this. They need to understand technology. It's not enough in 2022 to just understand your business. You got to understand how technology uh, uh, you know, accelerates it, how it's a critical entity, um, and how it disrupts it, too. I mean, that's the one thing in, in OIT I used to tell our workforce was technology is disrupting every industry vertical it's even disrupting technology right uh, so let's let's ride that wave let's find a way to positively disrupt ourselves and to create better outcomes um, you know or, or they will be thrust upon us what, what would be the biggest disruptor when you're talking about a government agency <sighs> Well, I mean, I, th I think uh, I don't know if it's the biggest, but I, I, you know, I would I would think that you know what we saw with technology and remote work, all the tools that that we're able to utilize to enable remote work. You know, everyone's fond of saying that uh, you know we operated just as efficiently remotely as we did when when we were in in you know on premise in person. Um, I think that's open to a little bit of debate, but certainly. The, the critical path, the essential ingredient for all that was all the technology solutions. You know, at VA, we fielded a number, uh, you know, a family of about two two v, uh, video connect platforms that were state of the art, right? And I used to have to evangelize and explain to our line of business partners, you have top tier commercial solutions. You know, this is not your mom or dad's VA where 20 years ago you would have had some East German software knockoff, right? You, you have top tier, the best of the best available commercially, and we're procuring that. And that was an essential ingredient. I think the other thing as you look more to the future is the migration the continued migration to an OPEX environment, right? So, you know, we, we, we get out of everything having to be on premise in a VA data center uh, or any federal agency. And, and we, we allow our industry partners to assume that technical debt of the software, take it out into a software as a service, a platform as a service, or an infrastructure as a service environment. You know, you're going to pay more in the near term, right? That's, that's one of the things that was always the bane of my existence is people say, we're going to save money. Uh, you're not not going to save money. Matter of fact, in the year of execution, you're going to spend more. But over time, as you invest and shift that technical debt and risk, you get to a situation where it's levelized investing and you're realizing the true costs of technology instead of these peaks and troughs of trying to, you know, boom and bust cycles of spend and then decline and then catch up and then decline. Because uh, that's not, again, with technology being that essential component, that's, that's just not fair to the business partners in delivering on their outcomes. Great points. So is there anything that you learned in particular that perhaps gives you new perspective now that you're in your next phase? Well, I would I would say it's probably just more of the same. I mean, when I swore into VA in 2019, I, I committed that I would have a ruthless focus on the lines of business and their outcomes. Uh, that didn't mean that I didn't pay a pen, did not pay attention to the enterprise aspects of of OIT. I certainly did. There was you know we could have a whole podcast just talking about that. Uh, but I would say it's more of that. Um, again, uh, you know, I, I complimented the chief acquisition officer, Mike Parrish, up front. Um, it, it, it requires that industry engagement. You know, I, I, I mentioned before we started that uh, I was talking to an industry partner and they were trying to get a meeting with a, a government senior executive. And the, uh, the executive assistant said, well, the executive is not taking uh, meetings at HIMSS with industry partners, and we, you know, to which we both kind of quizzically looked at each other and said, well, what is this event all about, right? I mean, this, this is where you have 700 of the top top exhibitors uh, in the commercial healthcare space, this is precisely the place to be having those meetings, you know, not just talking amongst ourselves as government people or, uh, you know, uh, receiving awards or going to nice happy hours, right? It's, it's, it's having those critical meetings, understand what industry partners are working on, where they can deliver better, faster outcomes where they can assume more of the risk and be rewarded for it, right? It's going to, again, you're not going to save money. You can't have all of those things and save money. It's technology in all of our lives, both personally and professionally, is going to continue to cost more. We're back in person too, so take advantage of that, guys. <laughs> so what have you looked forward to at this conference? Were there any surprises other than, you know, 
No, I mean, other than the executive not having a meeting with industry partners, no, I mean, uh, that that was a surprise. No, I, I think um, uh, I was at the opening executive session with John Mackey, uh, the CEO of Whole Foods, and, you know, just the connection between, uh, you know, health and nutrition, right, and, 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 and fascinating conversation around that. Uh, I, I think it was Steve Jobs years ago that says, you know, uh, make sure you take, uh, you know, the right food, you ingest in the right food. Otherwise, later in life, your medicine will become your food, right? And so I, I think it's it highlights, again, the responsibility for all of us to play a part in that health ecosystem and certainly the individual patient, too. You're making daily – all of us are making daily choices uh, that it, that impacts uh, the, you know those health those future health situations. It's the other session I was in. They were talking about the role of primary care and the next generation, Gen Z and millennials, uh, and it was it was not a good future, right? And in terms of accessing medical services, uh, you know, understanding the role of primary and special care providers, and so again, you know, health 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 and health IT, you know, strong connections and. You know, health is a is not a spectator sport. You know, we all we all play in it. We all have to play in it. Well, thank you, Jim. It was fantastic catching up. I'm so glad to have welcomed you back to GovCast in person here at Hims, and it was it was great to learn your next journey. Great, Amy. Welcome back to you too. Thanks for tuning in. Follow our other shows for more coverage throughout the conference this week. You can head to govciomedia.com to find more Hims insights and to subscribe to our newsletter. GovCast, along with CyberCast and HealthCast, is a production of GovCIO Media and Research. For more podcasts and to check out the other shows, head to govciomedia.com. Watch out for new episodes released every Tuesday and Wednesday across our shows. You can follow all of them in your favorite podcast platform. And if you like what you heard, make sure to let us know by leaving a review. And if you have any topics you think we should look into, contact us at newsletter at gcio.com. 